begin a very important topic tonight. There's actually various midot that are going to be covered. Kapdanut shlemut and vatranut. In English, the meaning of these characteristics are strictness, perfectionism, and being forgiving. And the reason why I'm lumping together several midot, as you will see, there's a certain relationship between them. We're going to even talk about extremism a little bit, kanaut. So let's begin with kapdanut. We need to first define what it is. And after we define what it's all about, as we always do, we'll get into the problems of this midah, the weaknesses or the strengths. And then we'll deal with ways of perfecting it, refining it. One who has this particular weakness, what could he do about it? Or if you know someone who has it, how could you help them? So how do we define kapdanut? The basic English word that would best characterize kapdanut is being strict, rigid, tough, stringent, and sternish. These are all synonyms, words that pretty much say the same thing, but you know what I mean. You, I'm sure, can identify this in certain people that you know. You may have it yourself. <laughs> kapdanut can be good, but can be very bad as well. There are certain midot, believe it or not, that can be used in a positive way. So we'll cover a little bit of both of them. The foundation where this midah evolves from, where does it come from? There's a, a foundation beneath this midah that you don't see on the surface. We see things on the surface. We see someone being strict, but we don't know where it comes from. Some people just like to say, oh, he's just born like that. There is something called mazal, of course, and that everyone's mazal definitely endows him with certain inclinations. So people have netiyot, as they're called in Hebrew. But that's not a good excuse. We want to know what the yesod is, because once we recognize the yesod, the foundation, and the shoresh, the root, then we're able to cure it. Just saying, oh, that's the way he is. He's a Scorpio, or he's a Sagittarius, or he's a Leo, or a Taurus, or a Gemini. That does not tell us too much. It does help us a little bit, because then we have an idea where it's coming from, right? But we still want to know how to deal with it. That's the key over here. He's not just talking about it. Okay, we have a problem here. He's like this, or she's like that. But what are you going to do about it? So the Yesod, the foundation of Kaptanut, has to do with what we call in Hebrew tsarut ofakim. It's a certain narrow-mindedness. It has to do with the lack of flexibility. And sometimes it also has to do, to a certain extent, with ahavata diyuk, people who love exactness. <coughs> and the reason why I mentioned this detail is because we're going to talk about perfectionism. And perfectionism is a form of being strict, strict with yourself or very demanding of yourself. So we have to cover the various aspects of this midah, where it comes from, what are the roots, and what are other midot that perhaps are related to it. What is the shoresh? What is the very, very root that gives this midah any strength whatsoever? That's gava. Gava being one of the parent midot, one of the most fundamental midot, negative midot, of course, but it's fundamental meaning that it's all the way on top. It's, uh, it's very much present from birth. People have it in different degrees. It is a parent midah of, from which there are many toladot. Toladot meaning there are many descendants or consequence, consequential midot that are derived or come about from it, spring out of it. So kabdanut at its shoresh, at its very root level, has some gava. I say some gava because it doesn't have to be that, that this person is a big shot, that he's so arrogant, that he's a shachtzan, as we call him in Hebrew. Not necessarily. He, but he could have some degree of gava, and it, some degree of gava is even actually healthy. It's called self-esteem. You want to love yourself. You want to believe in yourself. You want to, you know, hold of yourself. But be careful not to take it to an extreme. So a person who is a kabdan definitely has some high degree or developed form of gava at its root. This particular midah, the problem with it is not only in itself 
what it, what it could do, the harm, the damage that it can do to the person and to others, it also could lead to other midot. There are certain midot that if we don't control them, certain characteristics, they can easily lead to others. This one can lead to kaas, can lead to anger, can lead to machloket, which is basically being argumentative all the time. It could lead to lashonara, which means to, to look down at others, to, to be disrespectful of others, to, to slander others. All because of the kabdanut, that a person is so strict and so demanding or exacting, and his expectations are, of course, going to be certain expectations from others, that because of that, he's going to find himself in, in a lot of trouble. Rabbis tell us that this midah will affect people differently depending on their role. What is their role? What is it that they do? Are we talking about a parent? Are we talking about a teacher? Are we talking about a coworker or a boss? It will make a difference. If it's a teacher, lo kapdan melamed. If you're a teacher and you are a kapdan, you're very strict, you're not going to be an effective teacher. The students are going to be afraid of you. They are not going to ask questions. They're going to be embarrassed to ask. You're going to yell at them. The, if, the, if the more, if the teacher is strict, he's going to give them a hard time. They're not going to even learn well because of that. Even if they're good learners, they will still suffer as a result. So as a teacher, the teacher will fail, or will at least not succeed as much as he could had he not been so strict. If it's a, t if it's a parent, a parent is much more critical. A parent, a parent hopefully spends more time with his child than a teacher. How many years is a teacher going to be with the student? A parent, if he is very strict, he may be limiting the growth of the child, not allowing him to be independent, to think for himself, to develop to his maximal potential. It could ruin him in many, many ways. He could become fearful, not believe in himself. He will not develop right, all because of a parent or the two being overprotective, being strict. You know, when we say strict, it has various forms. You know, curfew, you better be home at 10 o'clock. But he's not strict in other areas, maybe. There are parents who are strict in every respect. There's different kinds of strictness. But you understand what I mean by strictness. A parent who's very, very strict, a child will suffer from it. It's not a good thing to be overly strict. And some people have that in them, and they don't realize the damage that they're doing to the children, but not allowing them to be themselves just a little bit. Allow them to be themselves. What about if you're a boss? As a boss, not only will the relationship with the workers, with the employees, be cooler as a result of being so strict and so kapdan, the productivity of the worker will go down. At fukashelo, his productivity will go down. It will not be as good. He will not be as devoted. He will not be as excited to do the job. Regardless of the job, if his boss is so strict, he's not going to be so happy and excited to do. Now, it's important, of course, that the boss be very clear and, 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 and have certain expectations. But from that point to being very strict, there's a, there's, there's a lot of uh, room. I mean, you don't need to be the very extreme of strictness with them and expect them to be perfect and not make mistakes. So uh, uh, a ma'avid, an employer, also will lose out a great deal if that's the kind of relationship he has with his uh, employees. Rabbis tell us that anyone who's overly strict easily makes mistakes. Moshe Rabbeinu, because he was strict, because we kpid, there's an incident in Torah, several incidents actually, where he was a kapdan, where he was strict, and because of his strictness, he made a mistake. He forgot an halacha. He did not realize something. He missed out on the detail. All of that's because of being strict. If a person is a hacham, the rabbis tell us, and he's a kabdan, he, he loses his chokhmah. He loses his wisdom. If he had ruach hakodesh, divine inspiration, he loses ruach hakodesh. Eliyahu anavi, Eliyahu the prophet says, I don't appear to people who are kabdanim. So you can have a great rabbi, a tzaddik. He does everything perfect. Eliyahu Nabi will not appear to him because he's too much of a kabdan. He's too strict with people. So uh, <laughs> we see how people can lose out because of the strictness. This could be a great problem in a different area, in, a, in an area that we don't we least expect it, but it could happen. 
And that is, let's say we're dealing with a religious family, it's an observant family. But because the father, the husband, is very, very strict, imagine that they forgot to turn on the lights in the bathroom before Shabbat. You know, we turn on the lights, we do certain things before Shabbat, because we can't do them on Shabbat. And let's say somebody forgot to do it before Shabbat. Now, because they know that their father is very, very strict and he's going to do something about it, he's going to hit, or he's going to punish, or he's going to yell, regardless. Because of their fear for him, they're going to be mehalal Shabbat. They're going to desecrate the Shabbat to turn on the light to do something that they're not allowed to do because they're afraid. The Gemara brings an incredible story. There was one big rabbi, big rabbi, but he was very, very strict. And he was coming home for dinner. And they just somehow did not manage to cook up dinner for him, his servants. And because they did not manage to make dinner ready for him, and they knew how strict he would be and how mad, upset he would be, they, they, they went and cut a piece of an animal with al shahita, ever mina hai. We're not allowed to eat, to eat a limb from a living animal. You're supposed to make shahita, slaughter the animal, once he's dead. Then you cut up the, the meat, you salt it, you, you do whatever you want later. So they were such in a rush that they cut the animal, they cut the piece of an animal to prepare to cook it even before he was dead. He obviously didn't eat it because somehow at the last moment they realized, you know, uh, what was going on and they did not serve him, taref, chazu shalom. But it could have happened. Look how close they came to giving him something not kosher because they were so afraid of him. Parents have to be very careful. There's even an incident of a child, I recall, in the Gemara, where his father always used to threaten him if he were to do something, and once he did it, and he was so afraid of his father that he went and committed suicide because of his fear for his dad. There's all kinds of stories of kids or spouses, because of their fear, because, what does the fear come from? Because of the strictness of the spouse or the parent, they did all kinds of terrible things. This strictness is also not healthy for the body. Anybody who's very strict and very much a perfectionist, very much demanding, he's not healthy. He's stressed. He's always tense. It's not a, it's not a healthy symptom. It's not a healthy thing to be always... Um, having certain expectations and always being disappointed if they're not met, it takes a toll on, on the physical body. In speaking about strictness, Kabdanut, I mentioned earlier that it also, it also includes perfectionism. And when I say that something is detrimental to the health, I especially am referring to perfectionism. Somebody is very, very strict. Well, he's strict. It could be he'll be fine. The ones who really suffer the most are the ones who are perfectionists with themselves. And I'll tell you why. There's two kinds of perfectionism, the psychologists say. There's maybe more, but the basic ones is the one who is more of, a, he has that in him as a belief that this is the way it needs to be. It's an ideal. It's a belief. It is something that is important to him. That is his nature to do things properly, correctly. This is an acceptable form of, per of perfectionism. It's acceptable. There are people who are more perfectionists than others. But he looks at it as a belief, as the right thing to do. Then you have those who are neurotic. You know what it means to be neurotic? When a person has a compulsive kind of a behavior, when it's a, when it's a psychological problem, when it becomes obsessive about something, then you're dealing with a real, real big problem. That, need, that individual really needs help. But we're not going to do a whole lecture about this neurotic problem because these people actually need professional help. But a little bit of, 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 of a help we can, that we definitely could include because there are tips that apply to those who are perfectionists and those who are strict, tips that are very, very similar. But I'm just reminding you that there are individuals out there who have this compulsive problem and there are various degrees of it. There can be someone who is perfectionist to the point where he is obsessed with something or it could be that he's not just obsessed with it he's fanatical about it and once we talk about fanaticism we have to understand what 
extremism means. How do you understand somebody who's, a, who's an extremist? Whether he's a Muslim, or he's a Christian, whether he's a leftist in Israel, or he's all the way on the right. You have people who are extremists. What is that? Isn't that a form of, of uh, strictness and perfectionism? It's a little bit different, obviously. It's kanaut, as we call it in Hebrew. But you will see how there's a certain connection between all of them. An individual who is a perfectionist in the neurotic form, in the compulsive form, where it's really a problem, what is happening in the substrate, what is happening deep down in his mind, is he needs control. There's a certain amount of control that he feels he needs. He fears making mistakes. There's a fear, a real fear, phobias. You know, there's different kind of phobias. This man, this individual, has a fear of making mistakes. He wants to be above criticism. He can be stubborn. He's, and he's emotionally guarded. These are just a few issues that psychologists cover or, or identify that these individuals may have. Okay, fine. These are the problems that he has. Now what? Well, if you don't help this individual, what you will have is the possibility, the potential for depression. Right? Because he's a perfectionist, right? If, because he, he has certain fears of making mistakes, because he's not doing as well as he, he would like to do, he may become depressed. There may be procrastination. We spoke about procrastination. This is one of the individuals who may procrastinate. It's either all or nothing. There are people who have that state of mind. It's either all or nothing. There's nothing in between for them. No gray area. It's either black or white. And because of that, they procrastinate. I can't do it right, I'm not doing it. I can't get it done. You know, it, they don't want to do it half ways. It ha has to be just right. They'll erase something many, many times. Have you ever seen people wrote it, erase it, wrote it, erase it? They, they barely get anything done. And that leads to low productivity. Low productivity, as we said before, is a problem where a person will not yield or will not will not do as much work as he could potentially do otherwise had he not had this problem. So this individual who is a, per a perfectionist in an obsessive way needs a lot of help. What about the extremist? The extremist has an additional little detail. But this detail is very similar to the other ones but it's, it's to an extreme. And that's why he's called an extremist. And what is that? The choser nechonut, as we say in Hebrew, the unwillingness, lit pasher. No, no, he's not ready whatsoever to make any compromise. The word compromise does not exist in his lexicon. It's not part of his vocabulary. We believe in something called compromise. It's a beautiful thing. Sometimes you need to make compromises in life. You know, the two of you are right. So, now what? So, you've got to make a compromise. Nobody's saying you are right and he's wrong. You're, the two of you are right. So, but how could the two of you be right? You know, you have to implement one idea. So, which idea are we going to implement? Well, maybe we'll make a compromise. Compromise is acceptable. Sometimes this is what you need to do. So, anybody who's an extremist has this additional detail to the, to the very extreme of no compromises. It could be that he's a fanatic. He's single-mindedly believes in one idea, plus he's not tolerant of other ideas, or he's obsessed about something. There's various degrees in extremism. And depending on the degree of how fanatic he is, he may be willing to kill because of his beliefs. He's so crazy about what he believes in. So people are having a hard time. There's a lot of experts. You know how many experts are working trying to figure out the Taliban? What's going on in their mind? If we can only figure them out, maybe we can somehow fix them. Maybe we can somehow relate to them. Yeah, you need to understand your enemy. You need to understand people like that because you want to know how to deal with them properly. Well, maybe you can't. A person can only be helped if he's willing to help himself. But if he doesn't think there's anything wrong with what he believes, if he thinks he's right, you're going to have a very hard time convincing him otherwise. You can convince a person who is stubborn. You can pressure him. You can encourage him. One who thinks he's right, how are you going to change his mind? 
He doesn't want to listen to what you have to say. He thinks you're wrong. It's a much more difficult battle when people think they are right and they are 100% convinced of their, that they are right. You're going to have a very difficult battle. So that's what extremism is, the lack of, or willingness to make compromises. And he, if he's a fanatic or if he's obsessed, it could be very difficult to deal with him. Okay, I was expecting somebody maybe to raise the following question. We find examples in the Torah of fanaticism, what some people would call fanaticism or kanaut, that is actually praised. In Has, Kanai for Hashem, he went and took the law in, in his own hands and killed Zimri and killed the non-Jewish woman who he was with. There are other situations where the Torah calls us to be what appears to be cruel to, towards Amalek. No compromises. And same thing with when conquering Eretz Israel with the seven nations that lived there that were idolaters. No compromises, no peace with them. How do we explain that? How, we, how do we reconcile that? Is there such a thing as a good fanaticism? Well, it's not really fanaticism, but is there a good or positive extremism where you're uncompromising? Is there anything like that? Yes, there is. There can be. And that's where it becomes tricky because somebody can easily come and tell you, well, how could you say this is not good or this is not right when you yourself are sometimes like this and, and your behavior shows extremism as well? How could you tell if something is positive or negative? It depends. What is bringing about? What is the root? What is behind the extremism? Is it love or hate? That's the big difference here. Is it love or hate? And for us to better understand this, I'm going to give you an incredible example that we just read last week's parasha. It's an incredible example for this, for what we're talking about. For those of you who aren't aware of what is Sota is, Sota is a woman who suspected, at least, of having betrayed the trust of her husband and cheated on him. Basically, she went up with another man. That's what the man suspects. He doesn't know. And therefore, he has to send her to the Kohen for an examination. With water, it's a whole ritual. If she did, in fact, sin, she did not admit, confess to it, she would die almost instantaneously. It was an incredible miracle during the time that this worked, especially during the First Temple era. You were able to see, if in fact this happened, that it was all uncovered. It was better than a polygraph. <laughs> she basically died. If it was not true, it was just he suspected that she did this. Because of the shame she went through, she would be blessed. If she never had children, she would have children. If she had children, but she had a difficult childbirth, she would have an easy childbirth. She would, she would be blessed because of all the shame and the trouble that she had to go through. This system, however, of checking the woman would only work if the husband was clean. If he also cheats on her, then it wouldn't work. Well, if he cheats, well, he deserves that kind of a woman. <laughs> Right? Well, it's not fair. He's doing things that are prohibited, and now all of a sudden he's upset at her. Well, it would only work if he was a righteous man. And why was it so necessary to have this done? Because Hashem does not want a righteous man to be stuck with a woman who's, who's not pure. And he's innocent, and he doesn't know. He's entitled to figure this out. But if he's as bad as her, well, the, the two are meant for each other then. But if, it's, if she is the one that made a stupid mistake, and she was tempted, and she fell due to weakness, to some affair, that she, whatever it was, then it's not right for him to be living with this kind of a woman. So the Torah wants to make either peace, your suspicions are groundless, you just thought she did, because you saw her talking to somebody privately, but she never did anything, or you know what? You were right. She strayed, and therefore you get a divorce if she admits it. And if she doesn't admit it, then let her suffer the consequences at the Bet HaMikdash. So the Torah, in describing what happens to a husband, what motivates the husband, the Torah says what is motivating him is a ruach shel a spirit of being a zealot. He's jealous. He's a zealot. He's troubled by something. So the commentaries say, where does this ruach come from? Where does the spirit come from? Is it from the tum'ah, from impurity? Or is it from purity? What do, we, what do you mean? A spirit from impurity invades him? Has taken over him? Yes. If it's impurity, what it really means is the husband 
is really looking for a fight. He's looking to accuse, to blame her. He's used, he's, he's, he wants to instigate something. He's upset at her and other things, and he's just looking for excuses to get rid of her or whatever. It's a ruach of tum'ah, meaning it is possible that this man really is not sincere. And what's motivating him to be suspicious of her is really not because he's really suspicious. It's because he just wants to pick a fight, because he wants to get her to get into trouble. He wants to basically go after her. Or it could be a ruach tahara. A ruach tahara means a spirit of purity. He, he's such a pure man. He, he's such an honest man. He's such a good man that he's really deeply disturbed by the behavior, the un, immodest behavior of his wife. How could you, she be flirting with an, another man who's not her husband and who's not her brother, who's not her father? Flirting. It's not just, hi, hello, can I do that? It's flirting. The problem here is she's flirting and she's doing it in a private room. That's the problem. That's not modest. That is not nice for a Jewish woman, for anyone, to be involved in this kind of behavior. She's married. And therefore, he may be possessed by a ruach tahara, a pure spirit that does not tolerate this. He cares about her. He wants his wife back. He's concerned about her behavior, how she's dressed, how she's talking. So that's a ruach tahara. So what, what do we need to know? What's motivating him? So the rabbis are, are split, basically. Some say he's being possessed by ruach of tumah. Some say it's a ruach tahara. The reality, however, is there's no argument. There's, it's really the same. It, you could have an individual who is picking a fight, who's really suspicious. He's overprotective. He doesn't let his wife out. He closes the door behind her. He says, you're not leaving this house without me. I have to see where you're going. Where were you at this hour? Checks her phone. You have people like that who are so overprotective and so, so strict that they don't give any room, any flexibility whatsoever. That's a ruach of tum'ah that is invading them, that is possessing them. It's groundless. There's no reason to be so suspicious and so demanding. But there are individuals, there, are, they may, there may be out there a man, a, a husband, who has this ruach tara because he is a good man. He wants his wife to be a good woman. And he's concerned that she is straight. Well, some women stray, unfortunately. Some men stray too. So if it could be a ruach tahara. And if that's the case, he's entitled, of course, to check it out. So that, the reason I'm telling you this is because when it comes to Kanaut extremism, you could have an extremist that is being motivated for a good cause. His love for Hashem. His love for the right thing. He will not tolerate the Hilul Hashem, the desecration of Hashem's name. He will get up and do something when everybody else is afraid to do it. They're not sure. They're, oh, what is it going to look like? What is the world going to say? Who cares what the United Nations is going to say? You do the right thing. You do whatever is correct, whatever the Torah says. You can't take into consideration what these people are going to say. So that is a good kano, depending on what is motivating you. Okay, so how do we deal with this midah? The midah of of perfectionism, of being overly strict and demanding, how do we go about refining it? It is important to keep in mind that sometimes, even though we are right, it is better not to be right or not to demand on being right. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're going down Beverly Boulevard and it's green for you. And it's red for the guy who's coming from the other street. He's not stopping. Are you going to insist on your right away? It's my right away. It's green. <laughs> but he's not stopping. Are you still going to insist on going? You would have to be silly to get involved in an accident just because you are right. Of course you're right. So what? You would need to sometimes give in even if you are right. Otherwise, you're going to have an argument. You're going to have an accident. You're going to have trouble. You understand? So sometimes it's okay not to be right. In other words, it's fine to give in. Even though you are the one that's really, really right. So what if you give in? Nothing will happen if you're going to maintain the peace in the home. If you're going to, if you're going to get peace of mind, quiet, as a result of, uh, of giving in, isn't that worth it? Isn't that worth more than being right, being really right? So what if you're right? Big deal. So giving in is more important than being right, depending, of course, on what it is. In order to be able to achieve that, in order to be able to have 
that kind of attitude, that kind of thinking, one needs to be humble. One needs to work on midata anava. One needs to be a little bit more humble. Then he's able to, to begin to think positively in this way. And that is why the rabbis tell us, Le'olam yadam anav kehilel velo kabdan keshamai. We're always better off being humble like Hillel, who was a humble person, and not so strict like Shammai. Shammai was a very strict individual, and he was very demanding, very perfection, perfecting. And uh, as a result of that, of course, he, he had a different kind of, a, of an approach to things. And the rabbis tell us, even though Shammai was right in certain ways, at certain times, you're better off. Between the two, you're better off being Anav, being a humble man like he led. Another Mamar Chazal that is very important is that they say, You're always better off being soft and flexible like the reed. Kane is the reed that grows in the water in the swamps. And don't be like the cedar. Don't be hard like the cedar. Look at this Kane. What do we make of the kane? Anybody here know? What do you make of the kane, of the reed? You make the, the scribe. You make the, what the sofrim use. What the sofer who writes the Sefer Torah, right? He, what he uses to write the Sefer Torah, Mezuzot and Tfilin, is made from a kane. Look what the kane, what zechut the kane has, what we make feather. from it. Feather. It sounds like what you were saying. Yeah, it's feather what they make from it. Soft, reed, flexible, moves with the wind. You're better off being soft than being tough, than being harsh. Yes, there are times that we need to be tough, but generally, you're better off in life always being on the softer side than being on the tough side. Except sometimes if you're soft, people step all over you. Obviously. That's why you don't want to be soft all the time. As the rabbis tell us there are some people whose life is miserable. Those who are, have pity for everybody. Arachmanim, Arachanim, Daninea Dat. Arachanim are the ones who are always angry. They don't, their life is not a hell, good life. Arachmanim, they always have pity. And they're always soft. People take advantage of them. And Aninea Dat, those who are very finicky and sensitive and delicate and, you know, and very picky, they also have a very difficult life, a difficult time. So we don't want to be anything in the extreme. Too much of anything is no good. But between the two, being soft and easygoing and forgiving is a, is a better midah than being always strict and, and demanding. This particular midah is especially important at one's home. You know why one's home is the more important one? Even though we said before at work it makes a difference, it makes a difference at school, if a person is very strict at home, he loses out more than anybody else. Because the Yetzerara, the rabbis tell us that the Yetzerara works double the amount of time and effort to get people to be negative, strict, and bossy with their wife and their children. At the home, the Yetzerara is working kaful. That is what the rabbis describe. Kaful meaning double. Double the amount of work, double the amount of effort goes into that midah that the, this husband, this man possesses. And as a result of that, things get out of control. Things break apart. Things just become very nasty. Just think about it. It also makes sense because we spend a lot of time at home. We're under the same roof for a lot of time. Many things can come up. A glass can break. Right? Uh, all kinds of issues come up in the home much more than at work, much more than at school. And here is a woman that you loved, that you gave her the ring, and that you said, Ariat Mekudeshetli, under the chupa. This is a woman that you once were very close. She was your best friend. She's the mother of your children. Or this is the husband, right? The father of your children. Imagine, the relationship was so close, but because of the strictness, because of the bossiness, because of mistakes, or because of the wrong attitude, or because of just doing things in the, in the negative way, instead of positive these mistakes take a toll on the relationship, and all that beautiful glue has melted. In other words, there's nothing holding it together as much. You have to redo it again. It's possible, but it takes work, and it takes the two to one to do it. Anytime two people want to do anything, it's possible. The problem is a lot of people who've gotten divorced, either one or the two of them are not interested in looking at each other. But when two people really want it, 
So they say, let's forget the past and let's make a U-turn and start all over again. So what if we're 65 or 70 years old now? So what? Without Hashem, we have another 50 years to go. I don't know about children again at that age, right? You can't start a new family, but you can do everything all over again. You can go on a honeymoon, you can go eat together, you can enjoy life together, you can enjoy the grandchildren together. There's so much things that you can do together. And, and life is not long. It's not really that long. It's, it's so short. Why, why waste time arguing about the past when you can redo the future? So it is possible, but it requires a, that the two people understand that in, in order to make it work, they can't repeat the mistakes of the past. Mistakes happen, but don't repeat them. Don't repeat them every day. Sorry, honey. Sorry, honey. If you say sorry, honey, once a week, fine. But if you say sorry, honey, every day, you know, I don't, think she'll, you don't, I don't think she'll buy it. To, what? But if you don't want your wife to yell at you every day, she'll say, sorry, sorry, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, yeah, but Sometimes after a while, I think, I think she's going to get tired after a while. No, you, maybe it's like you just calm it down, you know? Yeah, well, you have to do your best. You have to try anything you can. But women are smarter than what you think. They know if you are sincere or not. And I think your wife will know you better than your own mother after a while. <laughs> so she'll know if you're faking it or not. If you really mean it, however, Words that come out of the heart penetrate the heart. So if you really mean it, and you really regret what you did, then things can, things can work. Things can work out. So especially to be careful in one's home not to be a kapdan. Then there's something which people do not even realize. Okay, we spoke about the negative effects, being too strict. People do not realize that there's a big, big loss for anybody who's a kapdan. And this loss is not apparent to them. The rabbis tell us, Kolman de kapit kapdinan bahadei. Whoever is a strict person with others, be'ashamayin, they will be strict of him. Be'midash adam moded, modedim lo. In the way he treats others, they will treat him. These are two separate things, and they mean slightly different things, but let me, let me explain how important this is. If a person is very strict with others, and he did something terribly wrong, Bashamayim is going to say, well, just like he is strict with others, we're going to judge him in a strict way. He's asking for trouble. Because he's strict, they'll be strict with him. The other way around too. The other man, Mar Chazal, that says, Bemidash Adam Modet, Modedim Lo, the way he treats others, they will treat him. What does that mean? If you give people the benefit of the doubt, when the time comes and one is being judged for something he did, they're going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How are we going to judge him? We're going to give him the benefit of the doubt. That's what he does with everybody else. He's so nice. He's forgiving. We'll be forgiving of him. He is forgiving. means he's forgiving. He's easygoing with, either, with others. He's not so demanding, perfectionist, strict. He's forgiving. We'll also be forgiving with him. Look how one gains or loses as a result of his interaction with people. His interaction with Hashem is also affected. Will they be strict with him or will they be easy going with him? Okay, now that we pretty much have an idea of what the problem is and what, needs to do, what, what we need to do about it, it is important to, to keep in mind that there are certain midot that are the exact opposite that can tip the balance to the other side. In other words, there is a certain midah on the, one, on the one end, there is another midah on the other hand that if we adapt it, it could help neutralize it. Because we're looking now for ways of neutralizing, right? We're looking for ways to refine it. And we started off saying that humbleness is a very, very beautiful midah, which can actually help us in many, many midot, including kapdanut. What midah, besides humbleness, can help neutralize, can help, can help us tip, tip us over to the other end and not be so strict? It's called in Hebrew vatranut. So we've spoken about kapdanut, and now we're going to spend a few minutes on vatranut. Vatranut in English would be to be yielding, to be forgiving, to be flexible, easygoing. Right? The opposite of strict. And what vatranut will actually enable is one to be able to make compromises. If a person does not have that vatranut, the, the willingness to be vatran, to be forgiving, then why should he compromise? He will always insist on his way. And part of being vatran is the midah of ma'avir al-kol peshav, ma'avir al-kol al-midotav. A person who's ma'avir al-midotav means that he does not insist on having his way. 
Mavira la midot. Even though he has a right to be angry, he has a right to, uh, to demand something. Umavir. Mavir means that he gives so in. Goes. He forgoes. As we say in Moroccan Arabic, khfif and dif. In other words, you just let it go. You don't uh, insist on, on, on something. You don't demand on something. What's interesting about this midah of Mavir al Mitotav is that whoever is forgiving and yielding, Mavrim lo akol peshaav, they will forgive him all his sins. Easily. Easily. Not everyone is forgiven his sins right away. This one will be forgiven easily. So the Maran of Prague explains why. What zechut does this individual have that they forgive him his sins? Just because he is forgiving? Yeah. It's not just midah kenege midah. So the Maran explains that the difficulty that people have in conquering the Yetzirah and working on their midot is a real big difficulty because it's there from birth. It's ingrained in us. A certain midah, let's say a person is an, an angry temperamental person. Let's say that's his problem. If he keeps his mouth shut, that's admirable. But you know what it took for him to do that? Tremendous amount of effort. For a lot of us, it may not be so difficult to, to just keep quiet. But if somebody insults you, makes you angry, in a real, real difficult way, you may be tempted to yell back, to get angry. Comes along this individual who's ma'avir al midotav, and even though there was an elbon, there was a shame, there was an embarrassing act, there was an insult, nevertheless, he did not do anything about it, even though he could have easily done. Maram Prak says that took a lot of courage and strength. That courage and strength, the Maram says, is the ultimate ma'ala, is the ultimate the ultimate um, acquisition, uh, asset that we can acquire in life. This one is greater than all the ma'asim agdolim, all the, greater than all the mitzvot of, of many, many big mitzvot. This is a true accomplishment because this is difficult. Anytime you do something difficult, you know, was anytime you work on yourself, you conquer a midah, that is extremely admirable. And that is, and because the things that were done to you, like insults and injuries, slipped off of you easily. In other words, you did not allow it to affect you. So the same thing will happen to this avonot. The avonot will also slip off easily. That's how the Maral explains. You allow these things to slip off, to fall off, to not affect you. The same way in Hashemayim, they will not even uh, allow the sins to affect you. They will fall off. They will come off. They will be erased in the same way that you're willing to erase and to forgive the past. That is a, an explanation of, of why this ma'avir al a person who is forgiving, does not always insist on in having his way, does not always get back at people, does not behave, like, does not stoop to their level, even though he can. It is not an easy thing to do. It's a tremendous big midah. There's an interesting incident in the Gemara Masechet Ta'anit. There was no rain. No rain for a long time. Famine. You know what Jews do when there's no rain? They pray, yeah, they sure. fast. And they don't only pray, they send a big rabbi to pray. It's the Chazan. So, Rabbi Eliezer was sent, tremendous big rabbi, leader of the generation. After his prayer, his begging, nothing happened. Rabbi Akiva went down. As soon as Rabbi Akiva prayed to Hashem, the clouds came and it started raining. Rabbi Eliezer was the teacher, the rabbi of Rabbi Akiva. Why did they answer Rabbi Akiva's prayer? The Gemara says, don't think that Rabbi Akiva is greater. He's not. He's a student. They answer Rabbi Akiva's prayers, Ki avir al midotav, because he has that midah of being forgiving. He's always forgiving. He's not always insisting on being right. He doesn't always do you know, to the other what the other one did to him. Ma'avir al midotav. So the big question is, wait a minute. Rabbi Eliezer did not have that midah? You mean to say that a, a big rabbi in Tzaddik like Rabbi Yezid did not possess this characteristic that Rabbi Akiva had? So Rabbi Yaw Lyapyan, Zechit Tzaddik Lebracha, explains as follows. Of course he had it. But you know who Rabbi Yezid was? Rabbi Yezid was Kadosh Mirechem Imo. He was a holy man from birth. He had holy parents. He was a Tzaddik almost right away. It was spoon-fed to him. It was normal, regular education. It was basic stuff to be ma'avir al midotav. Of course he had that. You know where Rabbi Akiva comes from? You know what kind of a man Rabbi Akiva was before the age of 40? You have no idea. I mean, you have to know the history of Rabbi Akiva. 
who he was. He was an Amaretz. He had nothing. He was, he was not the same man who he became later on when he learned Torah. For him to be Ma'avir al-Midotav, for him to be forgiven, it took a lot of work. Wavad al he worked on his, on his Midot. It required a lot more effort. Kol HaKavod l'Rabbi Akiva. In other words, he's, he, his Ma'avir al-Midot is more admirable. That is why he had the Zechut. That is why Bashamayim did listen to his prayer. Of course the two had the Midot, but he worked a lot harder on this, and therefore his Zechut was greater. Okay, now that we more or less uh, understood that we need the opposite, we need to be Vatranim, how do we actually begin to become Vatranim? How do we become easygoing? Well, one of the things that we can do is to remind ourselves that uh, he's just as human as I am, right? I know not necessarily any better than him. He made a mistake, and I'm here being very strict with him because of this mistake. Well, I should realize that I could make that mistake too, just like him. After all, we're only human. So this, help, this kind of thinking helps me become a little bit more of a Vatran and not so Kabdan. He's only human. What do I expect of him? Right? People make mistakes after all. He's a human being. He's not an angel. Then why should I be strict with him? Okay. But what, what happens to parents who are strict? The, how are we going to teach the parents not to be strict with their children? You understand? The first example that I gave you was just in general. We're talking about adults, people who may be strict with each other, whether it's an employee, employer, whether it's husband and wife. He's just a human being. What about parents and children? Parents are sometimes very, very strict with their children. Now, this one is tricky. The reason why this is tricky is because raising children is a big challenge. Chinuch Yiladim is a tremendous challenge. You know what? We don't know. When we get married, we don't know all the rules. Did any one of you who's married and has children ever go to college to learn the rules of being a parent? Not even all the rabbis go through all the rules. Some of the rules are not even written. You know, every situation that presents itself could be different. It's a big challenge. What if you have a tough child? It could really be very demanding. What do you do? How are you supposed to deal with him? I'm going to, I'm going to tell you soon an incredible story of how two sets of parents dealt differently with their kids and you saw what happened as a result. But in the meantime, what do we do? Because we don't always know what to do, you know what the rule of thumb is? Ask. Don't assume you know what to do that you know how to do the right thing. You're dealing with a challenging situation, marriage, husband and wife, kids. You, you're better off not making a big mistake in the long run. So ask, especially if you have this problem come back and you want to do the right thing. Ask. Call up your rabbi. Ask some very good friends that you can trust. Not necessarily the therapist, the marriage counselor, especially if they're not Jewish. They may not give you the best advice. Go to somebody who has the right perspective, the right outlook. It's important, therefore, to seek advice, to seek help in areas that could be very challenging. What if a child has to deal with a parent? And this parent is very strict. How should the child deal with the parent who is being strict? There's a, several tips. There may be you know, more out there, but of, uh, tips that the professionals, the experts give. But, the basic tips that I can give you, can share with you now with how to deal with a strict parent is number one, it requires a tremendous amount of patience with them. <laughs> That's the way they are. So you're going to have to be patient. Number two, communication, open channels of communication. Daddy or mommy, this is the story. This is really what happened. This is the situation. Don't misunderstand. Please realize that this is, it requires open channels of communication. No distance and fear. Sit down. I'd like to talk about it. That's number two. Number three, give them people who are very, very strict, parents who are very strict, need attention. They need, a, they need to be given that attention. That attention is a form of kavod. It's something that they need. And you know the Holocaust survivors sometimes have this problem that they're so overprotective. My parents told me of a situation in Brazil where the mother used to come to the school to check on her daughter every day. Every day, she would check on her daughter. Did the Gestapo take her, Chaz Shalom? She had this in her mind, you know. 
People who went through the Holocaust have nightmares sometimes. The, you know, the people who went through all kinds of traumas, you have to be understanding and sensitive to that. So these people who are very, very strict may need, may require more attention than the usual. You need to give them that attention. You know, everything will be fine, reassurance. You, you can't just do away with it. You can't just ignore it. You can't just make believe it doesn't exist. It's a problem and you want to deal with it properly. As far as the parent with the children, children make mistakes. That's just a fact. Allow them to make a mistake. Nothing wrong, depending what the mistake is. In other words, if we want to treat this individual who is very strict, we have to tell him, listen, you have to allow for mistakes. Mistakes happen. Allow for it. It doesn't mean you shouldn't say something, but allow it, expect it. You know, like they say Murphy's Law, if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. <laughs> Just certain things happen, therefore don't take chances, right? Whenever you can afford not to take a chance. So this parent has to be explained, anybody who has this problem of being overly strict, you know, kids make mistakes. You have to expect it. If they don't make mistakes, it's, it's an incredible thing. Expect it, live with it, try to do whatever you can that it shouldn't repeat itself, try to avoid it, but don't make a big deal of it depending, of course, on what it is. But pe these people have to be taught that it is normal, it is natural to make mistakes. This, this idea that it's possible to make mistakes is a very important idea for perfectionists, too. Remember, we spoke about perfectionism. Perfectionism are, in a way, strict with themselves. It's okay to make a mistake. Nothing happened. It's human to make a mistake. They have to have this idea also ingrained in their mind that it's a completely acceptable, completely human to make mistakes. With perfectionism, however, it is also many, many times important to point out to them, make sure you have realistic goals. A lot of the, a lot of the time, they don't have realistic goals. They're not what they're aiming for, what they want to achieve is not really realistic. It's beyond their, their capacity. They just are not, they're not, they're not built for that. And they want to do things, every, it's impossible. So you have to have realistic goals. People have to be reminded that we're only human. And there's only so much that we can do. Sometimes we don't know how much we're capable of doing. It's true. So you have to do your maximum. But expect to make a mistake. Expect that things will not come out the way you want it to. And you'll be a lot calmer. And now for a punchline with extremists. This is a very important punchline. Because even though we only touched briefly on extremism, this point hits home. So listen carefully. How are you going to do with an extremist? An extremist is what? A man who's not tolerant, right? We're talking about the one who's not tolerant of other views, of other religions, who could be a fanatic or obsessed with a certain idea. But especially if somebody is crazy about his beliefs to the point where he's willing to kill, where he's willing to do terrible things to others as a result of his extremism. What do you tell him? We're talking about somebody who's religious here. This is called religious fanatism. There's extremism of all kinds, but there's also extremism in religion. Religious fanaticism. If you love God so much, then how could it be that you don't love all of God's children? After all, all human beings are God's children. Oh, this is a big shocker. It will shock any normal human being to his senses, because that's a fact. Uh, obviously, if he's a Nazi, there's a bigger there's a problem here. Because the Nazi will say, well, some human beings are not really human beings, they're really animals. So his whole mind is twisted. Yeah, that's what they believe, that Jews, and anybody who was not an Aryan, a pure Aryan, he was an animal, gypsies, animals. Less than an animal. Yeah, if he's chas uh, shalom retarded, mentally retarded, he's not fit. So that's a twisted mind. That's, you know, that's an exception. There are a lot of people who have twisted minds. And like, what did we say before? Anybody who believes that he is right, that it's going to be very difficult to convince him otherwise. Nevertheless, if he, he has any respect for human life, any respect, and he understands that every human being was created in the image of God, how could you not be tolerant of somebody who's different than you? Rich and poor, it is very easy for a rich man not to be tolerant of a poor man, to look down on him. It is not only a problem of a racist, it's a problem of a, of a wealthy man too. 
a lack of tolerance for somebody else who's different, who doesn't believe like you, doesn't behave like you. And a husband and wife situation too. You know, we just can't get along. She's so different or he's so different than me. What's wrong with being a little bit different? You expect him to be different. She's a woman and he, you're a man. That's already differences. You're built differently. She likes many pairs of shoes. So what? And all you need is one and a half pairs. One Actually day. two. One for Shabbat and one for the weekdays. But anyway, yes, so what? Is there anything wrong with that? Hashem made her like that and made you like that. We all have different needs. It's okay. It's okay to be different. Be accepting. Be forgiving. Work together. Yeah. Yeah. No. So the differences can exist. And if a person understands this, if he has the right of Shkafa, wait a minute, what's wrong with being different? Islam, Christianity, Judaism, they're different. But wait a minute, maybe there's a common denominator. They all believe in God, even though Christianity has a different definition a little bit. But look at the positive. Look at what unites us and not what divides us, what separates us. And that will help you be more tolerant. Okay, we've spoken about all the strictness, the bad strictness, the bad perfectionism. Is there any strictness that is good? We said in the very beginning that there is one kind of strictness that is good. What, what, what is the strictness that is good and positive? To be strict for Kavod of Hashem, to be strict for the mitzvot, to be careful and strict from not committing a navera. You buy something in the store, you want to make sure it's kosher. You want to be strict. You don't want to be lenient. Okay, I don't see anything in the ingredients. Do you, are you such an expert chemist that you know, by the way, all the ingredients? Number two, do you know that some things are not written on the label? And number three, even if they, they, everything is okay on the label, do you know that it could be made in the same machine where something not kosher was made? That is why we have supervision. How could you be, not le how could you be lenient? You have to be careful, because after all, what goes into your mouth is going to make a big difference to your neshama, to your soul. It may not be unhealthy, but your neshama will be affected. You can't afford to be lenient in this. There's other things you should be lenient about in life, and that is with people, maybe. But with mitzvot, has shown to be lenient. Okay, I missed the shiur. I missed the prayer in don't, don't think that Don't take that lightly. Anytime a person missed a mitzvah, missed an opportunity to do a good thing, if he takes it lightly, it's going to be easier for him to miss out again. The Yetzirah has become strong as a result. It will be more difficult for him to later catch up. Anytime a person therefore misses out on a mitzvah, he should have the attitude of a group of people in Am Yisrael during the time that they were in the desert. They are the group that brought about the mitzvah of Pesach Sheni. They were unclean. They handled dead bodies. And because of that, they couldn't bring the Korban Pesach. That's this week's parasha. And they approached Moshe Rabbeinu, wait a minute. Lama nigra? Why should we be left out? Why should we be deprived of doing a mitzvah? What do you mean, why should you be deprived? You're a patur. The Torah says so clearly. If you were tameh, if you were unclean, or you were very far, you were, in, you were, in, the, you were in Taiwan at the time of Pesach. Right? You were in Taiwan. You couldn't bring the Korban Pesach, you're too far. Right? So you're exempt. You're, you're not, I mean, there's no karet. You're not guilty of a terrible sin. If you could have, you didn't do it. That's a terrible sin. But they felt bad. Said, Why should we miss out? That is a very good attitude. And because they asked for it, they got the second chance of being Korban Pesach Sheni a month later in Iyar. So that is the correct attitude. A person has to feel bad. When it comes to mitzvot, you need to be strict. You need to be strict about time as well. Time is precious commodity. Don't waste your time. There's so many ways of wasting one's time today, especially with the internet. People don't realize how it becomes addictive and it just robs you of all the quality time that you could be spending with your wife and with your children and with the Torah. Be strict with time management. And as far as children are concerned, with educating the children, there's sometimes that you need to be strict. There are terrible things happening in the outside world that you have to be a little bit overprotective of them. You can't just let them do whatever they want. There was a story in Israel that I mentioned earlier 
of two groups, two sets of parents that raised their children very, very differently. They lived, both of them lived in, in the same kibbutz. They were actually neighbors to each other. And uh, one, from one home, all you heard every other day was shouts and screams. The father, the, I don't know how much the mother was strict, but the father was very, very strict. And the kids were always had to be careful because of the father's demands. In the other house, you never heard not even one shout. The parents were easygoing. They believed that let the child live his life how he believes. Okay. The kids grew up, they moved out, they got married. Sukkot comes around. And these parents, the two parents, are elderly already. And they need help. And uh, all of a sudden, some cars drive up to the driveway of the strict father. And who's in the car? The kids. Daddy, oh, let's build for you the sukkah. They all get together and they build the sukkah. The neighbor, whose kids were not so religious, was a little envious. He says, that's incredible. Of all people, I would have expected that the kids would never see you. <laughs> you were so tough with them. And here they come to visit you, I've noticed. They come to help you with building the sukkah. What happened? My kids don't even come visit me. Forget about coming to help me with building the sukkah. They don't even come to visit me. You know, there are people that are wasting in a convalescent home right now who have kids. Those kids don't visit their father. It's incredible. What happened? I was so good to them. I gave them whatever they want. They asked me for something, I gave it to them. I wasn't makpid. I wasn't strict. So the father, tell, the father, the strict father tells him, even though you were hearing from the other side of the wall, you were hearing my shouts and how strict I was, it was tough love. You know what, what his tough love is? It was for their good and for their benefit, and they were able to read me very well. They eventually came to realize that I was always right. Whoever holds back the whip will eventually hate his child. You can't completely hold it back. You sometimes have to be strict. Otherwise, you end up losing him. You have to be careful, however, not to abuse it. That's the trick with Chinuch Yiladim. As far as the other midah, the midah of being forgiving, I want to share with you one story which will tell you how powerful this midah can be. It's not only a good midah to be forgiving and to be easygoing with people, but it's also a tremendous zechut for an individual. It happened during the Six Day War. Yerushalayim was bombarded by the Jordanians, whoever lived especially close to the border. In the Shiva of Mir, they all went down to the Miklat. So, to, to the Bunker. To the bunker. Thank you. And in that bunker were other people from, not from the yeshiva, neighbors. And they all congregated together. And when, whenever a missile came and hit the building, they all started saying, Shema Yisrael, begging Hashem, save our life. And Baruch Hashem, at the end, everything was okay. Nothing happened to them. The Rosh Yeshiva of Mir turned to his students and he told them, do you know what saved us? It wasn't our prayers. Not mine, not yours. Woman. It was a, a prayer of a woman, an aguna. A woman who's an aguna, a woman who was left by her husband, who did not take care of her for the past 20 years, just left her alone, didn't divorce her, didn't do anything, just moved away, forgot about her. This woman who was an aguna was not attended to by anybody. Nobody helped her. She was very unhappy. And this woman, during the time of the bombardment, says, Akadosh Bahu, Ani mochele kulam. I forgive everybody. And in the same way that I am forgiving to everybody, Hashem, you can also be forgiving. It is b'schut this woman, I'm sure, he says, that the rabbi says, I'm sure that that is where that salah came from. We were protected because of her merit, the merit of being forgiving to everyone. Just like to end with, with a very important point that even though perfectionism, as we said, is not always good, it's not always realistic. There is one perfectionism that we all need to constantly work on, and that is shlemut ha-nefesh, ha-shlemut ha-ruchanit, that spiritually we perfect ourselves as best as possible. That has to be a constant aspiration of the Jew to always better himself. This is olam ha-asiyah, olam ha-tikun that we're here. We're here for that purpose. That is the main purpose of life. Yes, we've got to work to make a living. We get married. We have children. 
we continue to function and operate as other human beings too. But through the, the tool of the Torah and the mitzvot, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has enabled us to become better people. That is why in all of, all of creation, if you look at Pashat Bereshit, you will find that Hashem says about everything He made, Kitov, it's all good. It's all perfect. It's all for a purpose. On the human being, He doesn't say the word Kitov. You know why? Because it's up to Him to become Kitov. It's up to the human being, Bezat Hashem, to perfect himself to the highest state possible. If he does so, he has, Baruch Hashem, made it. He has succeeded in life. He has had a tremendous achievement. Not only the gold medal of the Olympics, but the, whatever medals are awaiting for him in Olam Abba. Thank you. Yeah, Shukra. So Shukra. This is a two-part middle, so one part, I'm just not sure exactly.